Okay, let's um, let's pray. Father, we we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for uh, the potential that each uh, day brings. We thank you for the Lord for for the promise uh, that is there for us, Lord. From you for each new day, Lord. We thank you. We bless your name. And um, right now, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, lead us, that you would guide us. Father God, I pray specifically that um, may there be a, a, a removal of limits and unlocking of potential, Lord, in our in our minds, Lord, in our spirit, Lord. I pray that you will you will cause that to happen. You will bring that to pass. And so, God, we we just um, surrender, place ourselves in your hands, that you might um, lead us, that you might shape us, that you might mold us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, understanding, knowledge, wisdom, Lord, everything comes from you, Lord. And uh, and as your word says, that the fear of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. So, Lord, we uh, acknowledging that and remembering that, Lord, we we come to you and, and uh, in all reverence, in all humility, knowing that you you know all things. There is nothing that you do not know. And uh, we also acknowledge that we are finite beings, Lord. There are many things that we do not know, God. And uh, and this morning, even as we come to your presence, we ask that you would teach us, Lord, as we journey with you, that you would teach us, that we would be humble enough to receive from you, Lord, receive from your spirit, Lord. I pray that you would continue to teach us, not just today, but every day, Father God. I pray that will be a learning experience, that we can look back at each day, uh, at the end of each day and say, this is what the Lord has taught me uh, so that I can walk in it, so that I can obey it and understand it and walk in it and uh, enjoy the benefits of it. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You walk. Or you want us to walk in the fruit and experience the fruit of walking in wisdom, experience the fruit of walking in your ways, Lord. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you lead us in all this. You guide us in all this. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, so last class, uh, if you remember, we, we, we were talking about creativity and, uh, you know, uh, we, we saw that, uh, you know, Yes, uh, we while well, we we understood that creativity, um, something about creativity that it is not just the, you know, the musicians or artists or uh, you know other things that who are creative, but each one of us uh, is uh, creative because God has created us. He is the creator, and He has created us in His image, which is uh, to be creative. Right. So God has created us to be creative. And and we, we also, in last session, we looked at how the creativity is the ability to make something new uh, by using our imagination and some original ideas, right? So uh, it could be in writing a book, it could be in uh, in making a video, it could be uh, uh, in in creative strategies for uh, maybe for outreach, for church, um, in solving problems. Right. So creativity uh, is uh, is used in all this, and and we see that the Lord Himself. We looked at the biblical perspective of creativity, like when it comes to solving problems, when it comes to um, yeah, when it comes to uh, you know, even ministering and effectively and so on. We looked at the biblical perspective where the Lord anoints uh, Bezalel, uh, the Lord anoints him in all forms of creative work, right? Uh, with regard to jewelry and and, and carvings and, and so on. So, so the Lord is able to do that and uh, understanding and wisdom come from him and he is the creative God, the creator God and creative God. So uh, we looked at the biblical perspective that it's for all of us, right? And we can uh, we can receive from him. And we also looked at innovation, creativity and innovation, which is uh, innovation is, uh, you know, to, to by introducing new changes, new methods to already existing, maybe process, it could be a way of doing things, you innovate. Right, you make uh, a change, to, and then you make a difference, uh, in, and it becomes effective. So you, in, so we talked about innovation as well, and um, 
Yeah, we also, you know, looked at how our brain has been created, how the Lord has created our brain. So, uh, you know, when more leaning, learning leads to more learning, and when we 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 tend to look for meaning and connection, uh, brains like to play, you know, sense puzzle solving things, all this, uh, you know, this is how our brain has been brain has been connected uh, or created to do, right? And we also looked at some of the uh, you know, collective ways, or one collective way by which we can, um, you know, creatively look for ideas, and which is the the method of brainstorming. Right? You sit together and we say, okay, oh, uh, everyone shares ideas uh, about a particular thing. You know, how to do it, or how to, you know, these are ideas. Uh, maybe about church, maybe about ministry, maybe about some area of work that we've been looking at. Um, to say, okay, this is. These are things that we can do. So um, you know, we looked at uh, brainstorming uh, very briefly. Yeah, today, uh, just going to look at uh, uh, look at one video that uh, which is again on creativity. Before we move on to the next topic, which is critical thinking. Okay, um, so this is a, a video on creativity. Uh, how to um, so it's it's on how to develop creativity. Okay, it's a, it's really a, a, it's something like a, a very short video. It's about, uh, yeah, it's about 18 minutes or so. But then, how to, you know, how to be creative. Uh, the thing is, you know, when it comes to creativity, we need to just like everything else, you know, like maybe gifts of the spirit and all that. We need to actually start doing it. Right? We can learn about it. We can read about it. But unless we actually put to practice, we, we will not be uh, actually enjoying the fruit of it, right? So, um, so we need to be actually doing it in order to see the benefit of it. Okay, okay so let's, uh, let's watch this video. And then we will, we will talk some more uh, about uh, what we what we watched, what we learned. Okay. Uh, let me share the video with us. What an amazing day filled with incredible ideas. So, where do these ideas come from? This is a question that I have been pondering for the last 35 years. Where do ideas come from? I started out as a neurophysiologist, poking little tiny cells with even tinier electrodes, seeing what they would tell me about creativity and innovation. After I finished my PhD, I went out to study and sort of learn all about creativity in the wild, working in big companies and small companies, even starting my own. And for the last almost 13 years, I've been at Stanford, teaching classes on creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship. And in my classes, I've done endless experiments with my students, trying to figure out what is involved with unlocking creativity. What I've realized over the last few years is that we look at creativity in much too narrow a way. We really need to open the aperture and look at creativity in a very different light. And what I've done is put together a model that I'm gonna basically explain to you in the next few minutes about all the things we need to unlock creativity. And I wanna point out, before I take it apart, that this innovation engine, that's what I call it, has two parts. The inside, is you, your knowledge, your imagination, your attitude. And the outside is the outside world, the resources, the habitat, and the culture. So let's start. Let's start where most people start. Most people start thinking about creativity by thinking about imagination. So let's start there. Now, imagination, one of the sad things is that we don't really teach people how to increase their imagination in school. And so, there really are ways to increase our ability to come up with really interesting ideas. We have to go back to kindergarten to see where the problem is. If you're in kindergarten, it's very likely you'll get a question like this. What is the sum of five plus five? So what's the answer to this? 10. You guys are really smart, right? OK, we know it's 10 because there's one right answer to this problem. But what if we ask this question in a slightly different way? What if we ask, what two numbers add up to 10? How many answers are this to this? Infinite, 
infinite number, and this is critically important and something that many of the speakers have brought up today, is that the way you ask the question determines the type of answers you get. The question you ask is the frame into which the answers will fall. And if you don't ask the question in a thoughtful way, you're not going to get really interesting answers. Consider the fact that the Copernican revolution came about by reframing the question, what if the Earth is not the center of the solar system, what if the Sun is? And that opened up the entire study of astronomy. But you know what? You don't have to do this in such a serious way. You can practice it every single day with jokes. Because most jokes that we tell are interesting because the frame switches in the middle of the joke. Consider this, the Pink Panther, if you've seen this movie, he walks into a hotel, there's a little dog sitting on the carpet, he says to the hotel manager, uh, does your dog bite? And the manager says, no, my dog doesn't bite. He reaches down, the dog basically attacks him, he says, what happened? He says, well, that's not my dog. <laughs> Think about it, whenever you hear a joke, you will find that almost always it's that the frame is switched in the middle, and it's a really fun way to practice framing and reframing problems. So that's one of the ways that you can increase your imagination, but there are other ways. One of the key ways is to connect and combine ideas. Most inventions in the world, most innovations come from putting things together that haven't been there together before, often in really unusual and surprising ways. One of my favorite ways to practice this is with the Japanese art of shindogu. Shindogu is the art of creating unuseless inventions. They're not useful. They're not useless, they're unuseless. And what they really are is a way of saying, there might be something here, but I'm not quite sure. So in this example with uh, the umbrellas on the shoes, well, gee, it might not be very practical, but it unlocks some really, really interesting ideas. Speaking of shoes, here's another shindogu. Okay, little dust pants. Again, it might not be practical, but you know what? There's an interesting idea there, again. You can use jokes for inspiration every single day. One of my favorite things, whenever I get the New Yorker, and I'm sure anyone who reads the New Yorker knows, the first thing you do is you open up the back cover and you look at the, the cartoon caption contest. The cartoon caption contest always puts things together that are not obvious, often because they're out of scale, or things that would be very, very surprising to have in the same frame. And your job is to come up with a really creative way to connect these things in really interesting and surprising ways. So here's the caption for this cartoon. It is, we'll start you out here, then give you more responsibilities as you gain experience. Now, of course, you could come up with an endless number of other solutions. So those are two ways for you to increase your imagination, but there's another that I want to bring up today, and that is challenging assumptions. One of the biggest problems we have is that when we ask people questions and give them problems, they come up with the first right answer. And so we end up getting really incremental solutions. So what we do in our creativity class is we give problems that are really surprising where there is not one right answer. So here's an example of one I just gave recently. This is the exact design brief. Um, I gave this actually to a group of students at Osaka University. And uh, their challenge was to create as much value as possible, value measured in any way they wanted, starting with the contents of one trash can. They had two hours to do it. How'd you like that to do that? One of the interesting things about this assignment, and I put a lot of thought into framing the problem beforehand, is that trash is actually worth, has negative value, right? We actually pay people to take it away. So what happened is these students ended up spending quite a bit of time in advance of diving into the project thinking about what value meant for them. They thought about friendship and community and health and financial security, all sorts of things that ended up informing the way they thought about the trash cans that they were going to use to create some value. To raise the bar even further, I gave them uh, a little bit more of a challenge. I told them that I had sent a note out, which I did, to my colleagues around the world and invited their students to participate at the same time. So there were students in Europe, in Asia, in the US, and in Latin America, all doing the same project at the same time. So let me show you a couple of the things that resulted from this. A group in Ecuador started out with a garbage can filled with yard waste. Yard waste, I probably wouldn't have picked that trash can, but look how what amazing thing they did. They turned it into a beautiful mural. Or a girl in Ireland, her mom had just gone through her brother's sock drawer and had a whole trash can of old holy socks. 
You know what she did? They were all different colors, black, white, gray. She cut them up, sewed them together, and made this sweater. Pretty cool. I hope some of you will go through your sock drawers later today. <laughs> so these are three things you can do to increase your imagination, right? Framing and reframing problems, connecting, combining ideas, and challenging assumptions. But unfortunately, this is not enough. You need to look at the other pieces of the innovation engine. And one of the next pieces on the inside is your knowledge. Your knowledge is the toolbox for your imagination. Today we heard all about medical um, breakthroughs and about autonomous vehicles. And why? How could they make this? These folks needed a depth of knowledge about medicine or about engineering to bring these ideas to life. Now, of course, you can learn things by going to school, by reading books. But one of the most powerful ways to learn things and to gain knowledge is by paying attention. Most of us do not pay attention to the world around us. Not only do we miss opportunities to see problems we can solve, but we also miss the solutions that might be in front of us. And one of my favorite ways to, to teach students this is to send them out into locations they've been to many times before and get them to look at them with fresh eyes. But I'm not the only one who does this. I want to tell you a quick story about a friend of mine, Bob Siegel, who's a professor here at Stanford, who taught a Stanford, a Stanford um, sophomore seminar for two weeks, and it was called the Stanford Safari. And the students basically over two weeks acted as if they were naturalists, as if they were just like Darwin in the Galapagos, but they were on the Stanford campus. And they talked to everyone they could to give a different point of view and perspective about Stanford, from the groundskeepers and the pest controller to the librarians and the organists and all the living Stanford presidents. They walked away not just with a deep understanding of Stanford, but an incredible appreciation for how important it is to pay attention. But imagination and knowledge are not enough. Every person needs to have the attitude the mindset, the motivation, the drive to solve the problems they're going to solve. If you don't have that drive and that motivation, you're not going to connect and combine ideas. You're not going to reframe problems. You're not going to challenge assumptions and go beyond the first right answer. Most people, unfortunately, view themselves as puzzle builders. They basically see themselves as having a very defined task, and their job is to get all the pieces and put them together to reach that goal. But what happens? If you're a puzzle builder and you're missing one or two pieces, what happens? You can't reach your goal. True innovators, true entrepreneurs actually see themselves as quilt makers. They basically take all the resources they have around them. They leverage the things, even the garbage can, right? They leverage the materials they have that, they're avail that are available to them and create something that is surprising and really fascinating. This is incredibly important. We have to view ourselves as, as those who can leverage resources we have around us to really make amazing things happen. So this is our internal combustion engine for creativity. Our knowledge is a toolbox for our creativity. Our imagination is the catalyst for the transformation of that knowledge into new ideas. And our attitude is the spark that gets this going. But unfortunately, that's not enough. And it's one of the reasons why there are so many amazingly creative people who are basically not living up to their creative potential. Because they're not in environments that foster and stimulate and encourage this type of innovation. So we have to look at the outside of the innovation engine. Let's start first by looking at habitats. Now habitats include several things. It's certainly the people you work with. It's the rules. It's the rewards. It's the constraints. It's the incentives. But even more than that, it's the physical space. Consider the fact that when we're little, when we're kids, we go to kindergartens. They're stimulating environments. You walk in, you know it's a place you're supposed to be creative. It's colorful. There are a lot of manipulatives. You are, the room is very flexible. But unfortunately, you graduate from this type of environment, and you get to go study somewhere like this. <laughs> the chairs are lined up in rows and columns. They're bolted to the floor. And if you talk to anybody, you get in trouble. I have to tell you, I spent my entire growing up writing silence is golden, silence is golden, okay? And the fact is we then get very upset because the students, you know, they're just not so creative anymore and everyone laments that. And then they are successful in this environment and they go off to this environment where they were. And I know why you're laughing because it's all too familiar. These type of offices were designed to be like prisons. 
And unfortunately, what happens is we again get very frustrated that the people who are working in these type of environments are not very creative. The thing is, the space we're in tells a story. Every space is the stage on which we play off our life. And it tells us what role we play, how we should act. I'm fortunate enough to teach at the D school, and these are actually some pictures from my class. Now, it might look like the kids are back in kindergarten. They're actually working on a very sophisticated problem here, as are the students in this picture. But the room is much more like a kindergarten space, with lots of manipulatives, lots of things to prototype. The room is set up, it's like a, a theater. We can set it up differently every five minutes, depending upon what we want to do. Nothing is bolted down. Really innovative firms know this as well. This is a picture from uh, Google and Zurich. This is a picture from Pixar. These are not frivolous, because these are messages that the company is giving to the employees that's saying innovation, creativity, and playfulness are valued here. But this is not enough. We also have to think about the resources we have in our environment. And resources come in so many different flavors. Unfortunately, we think of resources as things like money. And money is a fabulous resource. We certainly benefit from it here at Stanford and Silicon Valley. But it's one of many resources that we have available to us. We need to look at the natural resources. We have to look at the processes we put in place. We have to look at the cultures we build. Unfortunately, I get a chance um, to see this happening in different places of the world. I, I was up in northern Chile recently, and it was absolutely spectacularly gorgeous up in the north of Chile. You know, the beach was endless. It's 3,000 mile beach, and the Andes are there. And I said to the people in this town of Alta Vagasta, gee, what's really getting in the way of your success? And this man said to me, well, it's a really horrible environment. I said, really? Did you look outside? Because they didn't see, they were trying to replicate resources someone had somewhere else, as opposed to seeing the resources they already had. So here, picture of this city, think of the culture there. Culture is important. Culture is the last piece of the innovation engine. Culture is like the background music of any community, of any organization, of every team, of every family. And I'm going to play you two video clips to demonstrate this. Think of the music in these video clips as the culture in each of these scenes. I'm going to play the same clip twice. This is a clip from 1919 Coca-Cola Bottling Factory. OK? And I want you to think about how you feel, whether you would want to be there, and what you think is in those bottles. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next one. OK, you got the point, right? So the fact is, this is the outside of your innovation engine. But let's put it all together. Now, you might say, OK, Tina, that's really interesting. But how come you have this fancy Mobius strip here? You could have just had an inside and outside. But it's a Mobius strip because the inside and the outside are completely woven together. And nothing can be looked at in isolation. Let me show you how. Imagination and habitat are parallel here. Because the habitats we build are the external manifestation of our imagination. If you can't imagine it, you can't build it. And in addition, the habitats we build directly affect our imagination, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act. This is also true with knowledge and resources. The more we know, the more resources we can unlock. And the more we resource, the type of resources we have determine what we know, right? The more we know about fishing, the more fish we're going to catch. The more fish we have in our environment, the more likely we know about fishing. This is also true with attitude and culture. Culture is a collective attitudes of the community, and the culture clearly affects how each of us thinks. The wonderful thing, though, is this Mobius strip of the innovation engine 
is so powerful that you can start anywhere. If you're the manager of an organization, you can set up, you can think about the culture and set the culture. You can build habitats that stimulate the imagination. If you're an individual, you can start by building your base of knowledge. You can start with a passion and attitude that you're going to solve a problem. You can start anywhere to get this innovation going. The most important thing is that everyone, everyone has the key to their innovation engine. It's up to them to turn it. Thank you. Right. So that was a um, there was a lecture on creativity and how we can foster creativity, meaning how we can improve, build on, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and 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 really increase our creativity. So these are some some factors which we can look at: imagination, knowledge, attitude, uh, habitat, which means the space we are in, uh, the resources, and and culture. Okay, uh, so you know some of us will be uh, maybe maybe starting our own uh, ministries or church, or you could be you know uh, leading uh, certain teams. So you can think about this. You know, if you if you yourself personally, uh, you know, you want to be uh, or you want to grow in creativity, um, or if you want the team to you know come up with creative ways of addressing problems, creative ways of uh, solving challenges and problems, then we could think on these lines. Right? We could um, give input or uh, share input on how to address or how to uh, really improve uh, imagination. Right? Uh, or how we can share with the team and say, okay, uh, now, now, you know, the, uh, I mean, come up with in interesting ways to solve this. And, and so you uh, address the whole aspect of imagination, then knowledge, okay, what do you know about the problem? What do you know about the subject? All that also matters. So, and, and, and also, you know, all these other things. So, um, so, but the thing is, um, now this is from a, you know, very natural standpoint as human beings, as people who have studied human behavior and, um, you know, is coming up with this, but we know that uh, the source of all creativity, the engine of all creativity is is God Himself, right? And He has come to indwell us, right? Therefore, we can receive, we can le learn not lean not on our own understanding, but we can receive from Him, right? So, uh, so the importance of creative creativity, the importance of creative thinking, right? Which can which can solve uh, a lot of other problems, and I'm sure that. You know, all of us uh, would would be, you know, uh, creative in many ways in the sense, let's say, for example, you know, uh, at home, if, uh, let's say, the window is not, uh, or the uh, window or a door, you know, you, you close it and and maybe it's kind of come loose, okay, the hinges have come loose and it, it, it need, it will be closed only when you close it in a certain way, right? So we, we, or if something is not working, right? We we figure out ways. We figure out ways to make sure that it works. You know, we do some quick fix, some kind of a repair work, and you know, make sure that it's it's somehow. You know, if it stands at that, that angle, it will work. You know, uh, so like that. So we are, uh, we we do employ creativity uh, in order to solve problems. It's just that uh, we don't think of that when it comes to maybe ministry, maybe it comes to you know, everyday life, um, but we can, right? We can, and we we uh, we know that our God is a creative God. And so we can, you know, do these, um, make use of all these methods in order to be even more creative, okay? Um, the next one that we want to talk about is, uh, is also in the line of thinking, and um, it is called critical thinking, okay? Now, uh, see, we need to understand that um, our God has created our mind. Okay, uh, He has created our mind. Yes, He has created a spirit, soul, and body. So, um, with the with the spirit, we are able to connect to Him. We receive revelation in our spirit. But our mind is uh, uh, important as well. 
okay so many times when we say you know we want to live by faith or we want to we are pursuing the call and uh, the plans and purposes of god uh, and we are living by faith you know that does not mean that we have to uh neglect our mind right a renewed mind is a very powerful mind it's a, a renewed mind with a mind that is renewed to the word of god latches on to the revelation of god you know uh, latches on to the instruction latches on meaning you know holds on to the instruction of god uh, a renewed mind is something that uh, which we need to have in order to fulfill uh, uh, the plans and purposes of god to in, in fact to know the will of god we need to have a renewed mind so a mind is very very powerful it's a gift from god and we need to use our minds right so in order to solve again when it comes to solving certain things when it comes to making decisions problem solving making decisions now these are things that we need to do every day right making decisions we make thousands of decisions every day okay uh, what do i eat uh, when do i eat you know thousands of decisions what what clothes do i wear where do i want to go whom do i want to call what do i want to text make lot of decisions and and so also in our work in our ministry we will always be faced with a lot of decisions and some of these would be you know and and even as we grow in our responsibilities you know uh, some of these decisions are you know tough decisions or difficult decisions and uh, we need to be able to think in the right manner in order to be able to take the decisions and right? in order to be able to make those decisions which means um uh we need to be able to think um think right rightly okay uh we need to have the right assumptions which means that we in order to uh, um, have make a decision we need to as- make the right assumptions or have you know let's say uh, if you're um, if you're lighting the gas stove that means that your assumption is that yes there is gas in the gas uh, i mean the gas cylinder is fixed to the stove uh, and it will light up you know you make, so you make a decision based on the right assumption that it is all it's working it's fine so you can you know you know light up the gas stove so right assumptions and also you know you have the right information in order to be able to think rightly uh, in order to we you know in order to be able to make right decisions we need to have the right assumptions right information and based on which we we make decisions right so uh, this all points to the fact that we need to be able to think correctly okay in order to solve problems in order to make decisions so um, so this whole topic of critical thinking what does it mean okay critical thinking uh, is it important uh, what is it really so let me just put the uh, definition here you know um so what is it what is critical thinking it is the analysis and evaluation okay what does it mean to analyze something anyone what does it mean to evaluate what does it mean to analyze test it test it okay investigate test right see if it is correct um is it uh, you know is it meaningful is it correct to analyze right examine test um interpret right so we analyze something to evaluate something what does it mean to evaluate anyone evaluate it's it's the same like anal, uh, analyzing but you come to certain conclusions analyzing is the is the is the work of uh, testing investigating examining and evaluate is you come to a conclusion you using certain uh, you know you know certain methods uh, of analysis you come to a conclusion okay how how do i evaluate the performance of a student right so we evaluate after having certain tests and exams and then the based on the marks you e- evaluate and you come to a conclusion what is the what is the uh, the evaluation method is 
the tests or you know maybe the assignments and so on the and the evaluation uh, the conclusion is okay uh, based on this how has the person performed or how has the student performed right? so you analyze your value so critical thinking is the analysis and evaluation of ideas and information okay so we talked about creativity we talked about um, you know uh, creative thinking and so critical thinking will which will help in decision making problem solving it's the analysis and evaluation of ideas and information okay in order to form good judgments in order to form good conclusions now these good judgments and sound judgment is required right? maybe you're a person who's leading a team maybe you're a person who's doing things you know maybe uh, having your own business you need to have make certain decisions okay i'm going to buy so much i'm going to sell so much we are going to do this as a project you know you need to make certain decisions and of course you know as believers we are led by the spirit of god and the spirit of god also uh, you know gives us input gives us wisdom but we need to be able to evaluate discern and come to a place of decision making right so uh, so that's a critical thinking is the evaluation and analysis of ideas uh, and and it's important right for us critical thinking is important where in what in what ways will it be important um, when it comes to let's say you're discussing certain things okay you're in a team you're discussing so you need to be able to compare information evaluate certain things evaluate ideas let's, let's say somebody says okay now i think idea one works because of x y z you know some maybe some three or four reasons they give now we need to be able to evaluate those reasons does it work uh, are these really good things good ideas uh, so we need to be able to evaluate it and come to a decision right or come to a solution solution means answer you know solving something um so critical thinking is used uh, we we actually do it again just like creative thinking creativity we we do it maybe we've not given name to it but it's uh, for us uh, we need to understand that it's it's very very important and we need to be able to do it okay so now um okay we have yeah, 42 is it okay uh, let me just see if we have time for one more video and uh, we'll quickly watch it um okay um fundamentals of uh, critical thinking okay let's watch this quick video now uh, i just want to um, warn you that this this video you know it's a little bit uh, it it'll take some time right uh, in the sense it tests your patience but uh, i just want you to uh, you know give your full attention it's about it's about 9 minutes um so it will take some time but um yeah please give your full attention okay um just a minute okay uh it's interesting um but i just it, it needs your full attention okay one second so what we are watching is uh, introduction to critical thinking and uh, the critical thinking process okay. In this lesson, we're going to talk about three things. First, what is critical thinking? Second, what is an argument? And third, what's the difference between deductive and ampliative arguments? Okay, so what is critical thinking? Well, fundamentally, critical thinking is about making sure that you have good reasons for your beliefs. What does that mean? So suppose that you and your friend are talking about who's going to be at tonight's party. And she says to you quite confidently, Monty won't be at the party. You're not sure whether or not to believe her, so it would be natural for you to follow up by asking, why do you think so? And there are a lot of different things that she might say in response. We're going to talk about three possible answers she could give. First, she might say, I can't stand him and I want to have a good time. Second, she might say, well, he's really shy and he rarely goes to parties. And third, she might say, he's in Beijing and it's impossible to get here from Beijing in an afternoon. The first response that she gives you does not give you a good reason to believe that Monty won't be at the party. 
The second reason, though, is a good reason to believe that Monty won't be at the party. If he's really shy and rarely goes to parties, then it's probable that he won't be at tonight's party. Similarly, the third reason also gives you a good reason to believe that Monty won't be at the party. If he's in Beijing and it's impossible to get here from Beijing in an afternoon, then it's guaranteed that he won't be at the party. And when you notice things like that, when you distinguish between good and bad reasons for believing something, you're exercising your critical thinking skills. So critical thinking is making sure we have good reasons for our beliefs. And so one of the essential skills that you learn when you're studying critical thinking is how to distinguish good reasons for believing something from bad reasons for believing something. Now it's worth saying something about how I'm using the term good here. I'm not using it to indicate anything having to do with morality or ethics. So it's not morally right or morally good to believe something on the basis of good reasons. Similarly, it's not morally wrong or evil or wicked to believe something on the basis of a bad reason. Rather here, what it is to say that a reason is good is closely tied to the notion of truth. So a good reason for a belief is one that makes it probable. That is, it's one that makes the belief likely to be true. The very best reasons for a belief make it certain. They guarantee it. So why does this matter? Well, the reason that critical thinking is important is because we're rational. We want our beliefs to be true. Rational people want to have true beliefs, and they want not to have false beliefs. And the best way to, to be rational in this way is to form beliefs only when you find good reasons for them. Okay, that leads us to our second question, what is an argument? An argument is a set of statements that together comprise a reason for a further statement. So, for example, we can consider one of your friend's responses before as an argument. She's given you two statements, Monty's really shy and Monty rarely goes to parties, which together comprise a reason for believing that Monty won't be at the party. The statements that are the reason we call the arguments premises. So Monty's really shy is premise one, Monty rarely goes to parties is premise two. And the statement that those premises give you reason to believe we call the arguments conclusion. A good argument is one in which the premises give you a good reason for the conclusion. That is, the premises make the conclusion likely to be true. In that case, we say that the argument supports the conclusion. Good arguments support their conclusions. And bad arguments don't support their conclusions. So a key part of critical thinking is learning to evaluate arguments to determine whether or not they're good or bad. That is, whether or not their premises support their conclusions. The red argument is the first response that she gave. Two premises, I can't stand Monty and I want to have a good time. And the conclusion is Monty won't be at the party. And the third argument, which we'll put in purple, consisted also of two premises. Monty's in Beijing and he can't get from Beijing to the party in time, so he won't be at the party. Now, as I indicated before, the first argument is not good, while the purple argument is good. And here I can explain a little bit more about why. If you consider what the red argument's premises say, that your friend can't stand Monty and she wants to have a good time, and think about their relationship to the conclusion of the argument, you'll see that those statements don't make that conclusion any more likely to be true. The fact that your friend can't stand Monty and wants to have a good time doesn't do anything to make it more likely that Monty won't be there. It's simply unrelated to the conclusion. In the purple argument, though, the premises, if they're true, they guarantee that the conclusion is true. So they make it very probable. The truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion, and so in the purple argument, the premises do support the conclusion. Now, it's worth pointing out that the red argument, though it's bad as it stands, could be made a good argument with the addition of some background premise. So, for example, if you found out that your friend was the person who decided who was going to be invited to the party, then the fact that she can't stand Monty and wants to have a good time would give you a good reason to believe that Monty won't be at the party, because it would give you reason to believe that she didn't invite him. But as it stands, the argument is not good. Those two premises considered in themselves give you no reason to believe that Monty won't be at the party. Okay, our last topic is to distinguish two different types of arguments. So I'm gonna put up here on the left, the orange argument, which is the second response that your friend gave, Monty's really shy and he really goes to parties. On the right, we'll put the purple argument, Monty's in Beijing and he can't get from Beijing to the party in time. Both of them have the same conclusion, Monty won't be at the party. Now, as I said before, both of these are good arguments. They both do give you reason to believe the conclusion, i.e. both of them have premises which support the conclusion, but there's an important difference between the two arguments that I want to point out. 
if you consider the purple argument and think about what those premises say, you'll notice that if those premises are true, if Monty's in Beijing and can't get from Beijing to the party in time, then it must be true that Monty won't be at the party. Those premises guarantee the conclusion. In such an argument where the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion, we call the argument deductive. In a deductive argument, given the premises, the conclusion must be true. Just thinking about the information in the premises in a deductive argument gives you all you need to deduce the conclusion. If you look at the orange argument, though, you'll notice that that's not the case. In the orange argument, even if those premises are true, the conclusion might still be false. Even given that Monty is really shy and rarely goes to parties, it's still possible that he'll get over his shyness and suspend his policy of rarely going to parties and unexpectedly show up. It's unlikely, but it's possible. So the truth of the premises in the orange argument does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Arguments like this we call ampliative. In an ampliative argument, the truth of the premises makes the conclusion probable, but doesn't guarantee it. Now, as I said, both of the arguments are good. Ampliative arguments can often be very good arguments. They're just not deductive. The premises don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Now, when you're evaluating an argument, it can be important to know whether or not the argument is supposed to be deductive or supposed to be merely ampliative. If an argument is supposed to be deductive, but careful consideration of the argument reveals that in fact the premises don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion, the conclusion could be false even though the premises are true, that's often a good reason to reject the argument as a bad argument. Whereas in an ampliative argument, to notice that the truth of the premises doesn't guarantee the truth of the conclusion is simply to notice that it's an ampliative argument. If you were to object to the orange argument by pointing out that still the conclusion could be false, you'd really be missing the point. In an ampliative argument, it's taken for granted that the conclusion is not guaranteed by the premises. Rather, what an ampliative argument is doing is giving you reasons to think that the conclusion is probable. So knowing what type of argument an argument is, is essential to knowing which tools to use to evaluate whether or not it's a good argument. And we'll talk Okay, uh, just stop there. So just to give us, uh, you know, just an idea, what I'll do is I'll, I, this particular um, uh, video is there in the handout in the PDF itself. Um, so you can watch the rest of the video also. Uh, but just, just a, you know, just a, uh, a very basic idea about critical thinking. So you have premises, you have arguments, you come to conclusions. So you can use that in your decision making. You can use that in your, um, in, in, we can use this in our discussions. Um, and when, when we are stating something, when we are proposing something, you know, when we are uh, giving out some uh, ideas and plans. Uh, so we have premises which are true, which leads to arguments which are strong, uh, which are deductive in nature, which leads to conclusions which are definitely, you know, true and uh, which guarantees that uh, um, that that particular outcome will happen. Okay, so so this is. Uh, it's a very basic introduction to critical thinking. There are more resources on it, but just wanted to mention that we we this is very important for our decision making. This is very important for our discussions, deliberations. This is very important for our problem solving. Okay, so we'll stop here and uh, we'll go into uh, the next topic in our next class, which is group decision making you know how to make decisions as a group how to facilitate that um you know individually we can make decisions but how can we facilitate that as a group okay so we'll look at it in the next class okay so thank you god bless we'll meet again thank you, all right